So what are the social determinants of health? The social determinants of health are the conditions in one's surroundings where people are born, live, work, and play that affect their health and quality of life. Simply put, the social determinants of health are the non-medical factors that can influence one's mental and physical well-being. The social determinants of health are widely recognized as belonging to five different categories. As you can see here on the wheel, they are education, access, and quality, healthcare, access, and quality, neighborhood and built environment, social and community context, and economic stability. Are any of you guys familiar with any of these social determinants of health? If, if you are, you can write in the chat or um, unmute and maybe tell us which ones you're familiar with. And if you aren't, that's okay too, because we'll delve into each one of them individually in the next five slides. I think the one that I'm most familiar with is the social and community context understanding of it, but I'm excited to learn more about the other ones. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll start off with education, access, and quality. Um, one's access to quality education not only impacts the time during their formal schooling years, but the effect also extends well into their adulthood. Uh, access to quality education can influence many aspects of one's health. For example, Low socioeconomic status is associated with struggles in core subjects, such as math and reading, and forms of social discrimination, such as bullying, have been speculated as one of the many mediating variables um, associated with the link between these two things. In addition, the social and personal stress this can cause for some um, can reinforce uh, negative stereotypes and persuade one from completing high school or pursuing higher education. This means that these individuals are less likely to obtain safe, stable jobs with employee benefits such as health insurance. And in terms of mental health, low wage work is associated with increased likelihood of um, conditions such as depression, substance use disorders, and anxiety. And in terms of physical health, one is at a higher risk to develop chronic hypertension or high blood pressure, along with a host of other cardiovascular diseases. So healthcare access and quality. For more than you might think, healthcare is not readily available. Um, in Minnesota, we have it pretty good here, but especially in some rural areas or other states in the South, um, some people aren't so lucky. When it comes to looking at healthcare disparities, um, there are two aspects I like to consider. One is the issue of access itself and the quality of care laid out pretty nicely in the title. Um, when considering access, insurance is a major factor. Um, in the recent 2020 census data, the close to 10% of those living in the US did not have healthcare insurance anytime throughout that year. And that number amounts to about 28 million people. And this is not even including or acknowledging any of those who may be underinsured and just have minimal insurance that doesn't cover a lot of the general appointments or procedures that one may elect to have or only had insurance for part of the time. In terms of quality, uh, one point of interest is having the ability to see the same primary care provider on a regular basis. Uh, going to like a general practitioner or a pediatrician or whoever you go to just when you get a general cold Someone that knows your medical history, it's very important because they can keep track of you and perform checkups to ensure you're progressing in development. And later on in life, getting the recommended screenings for conditions such as cancer. When it comes to one's health, what is going on externally is just as important as what happens internally. Um, that is to say, one's surroundings can largely influence their chance at a healthy well being. Four aspects I like to consider are neighborhood safety, hazards, transportation, and recreation. It has been noted that in adolescence, um, one's community and peer group has an exceptionally strong influence on their behaviors and future outcomes. Thus, it is incredibly important for someone to live in an area with low rates of crime and violence. And currently, racial and ethnic minorities are at the most risk for living in these areas that can be harmful to one's personal growth. Moving on to environmental hazards, a well-known case study is the water crisis in Flint, Michigan. I'm sure many of you guys have heard about that. Um, in the large town of Flint, the contaminated water has led to adverse outcomes in children especially. 
Uh, specifically, abnormal brain development has been noted due to high concentrations of lead in the water. Um, and when pregnant mothers uh, drink this water, it contributes to damage that is irreversible uh, once it has occurred. And areas transportation is also something that's worth mentioning, I think. Uh, public transportation is a crucial to decreasing air pollution and thus improving community health um, on a larger scale. Public transportation also plays a role in helping to decongest the city's roads and can prevent ac accidents from occurring. Lastly, we can discuss parks and recreation, um, providing communities with opportunities to stay active, uh, will decrease rates of obesity and other related comorbidities will also follow suit. Violence and crime have also been shown to decrease in areas with well-maintained parks and available recreation opportunities. So in terms of neighborhood and built environment, can someone write in the chat what subcategory of this social determinant, uh, either safety, environmental hazards, transportation, or parks and rec, they think most urgently needs to be addressed, or maybe that they'd be the most interested in working on? Uh, there's no right answer, or at least one that I know of, but I think it'd be interesting to see your guys' thoughts. Okay, someone said environmental hazards, uh, two people, three people. Oh. From transportation too. Okay. Seems like the majority of people say environmental hazards. Um, does anyone want to unmute and maybe elaborate a little bit? Or someone who didn't say that, maybe too. Hi, my name is Nadia. I said environmental hazards because there's a lot of long term toxicology that is just blatantly unknown, especially in things like plastic products and um, everyday uses of. I mean, we don't know what's going to be the next lead paint of our generation, but it's likely there is something. Okay. Well, yeah. Thank you for thank you for sharing. I was not too familiar with all the toxicology about it, so that that was definitely helpful. Moving on to um, social and community context, as touched on earlier, one's social network is particularly important uh, when considering one's health. Well, much focus has been largely put on bad role models being harmful, it is also imperative to recognize the benefits of having good role models as well. Uh, naturally, humans are strong observational learners, so I think it's pretty important to have people in your life whose footsteps you can follow or who can at least kind of guide you down the right path. Similarly, I believe social support is really key. Uh, one needs to have people in their life who they can rely on to provide support, whether that be emotional, informational, tangible, financial, or other. As we all know, community participation and engagement is also key to building and maintaining a strong feeling of belonging and attachment to one's area. And social cohesion only really occurs in the presence of people who share emotional ties and a common sense of purpose. It's no shock that improving the well-being of the community will do the same to its members. Along the same lines, I think, is equity. Communities must be equitable to promote success of all of its members. Community can only really be said to thrive when all the people who belong to it are, are thriving. And I think a good example of this is one we all are really familiar with, um, the recent COVID-19 pandemic. And we could really easily see how the neighbor or the, how the health of our friends and neighbors directly affected us and our families. And lastly, we get to economic stability, um, perhaps the most well-known social determinant of health for most. Economic stability can be said to help form the base of many aspects of one's life, such as employment, housing, and food, which we will all cover. On average, those who have traditionally white collar jobs are less likely to be exposed to things like dangers on the jobs and more likely to have higher paying salaries with benefits such as paid time off, which can really help with the mental health. And the opposite can be said for those in traditionally blue collar professions. Housing instability is also a major issue. For most everyone, one of the most expensive recurring bills is for rent or a mortgage. When one is spending a significant amount of their money on housing costs, this can strain their ability to pay for other items such as food and clothing. Another aspect of housing instability, aside from just the general ability to pay, is the access to and quality of place of residence. For example, um, overcrowding can lead to like poor sleep and increased risk of 
transmitting communicable diseases. Finally, we get to food. As we all know, what we put into our bodies is incredibly important to our health and obtaining the proper dosages of minerals and macro and micronutrients is key to establishing and maintaining a solid healthy baseline. Unfortunately though, um, healthy food is not cheap. For those with inadequate income, it is easy to find themselves in a food desert uh, or place where healthy food is inaccessible either for geographic or economic reasons. For the past several slides, I just kind of gave a brief introduction of the five social determinants of health. Um, and while I broke them down separately and analyzed them, I think it's really important to remember that they all are interconnected and affect each other and are very hard to isolate when you're looking at them. Now, I think we're gonna put a quick poll in the chat and out of my own curiosity, can you guys just vote which social determinant of health that you found most interesting or surprising? And then once everybody's had a chance to vote, maybe we could share those results if, if that's possible too. Okay, wow, a lot of people said neighborhood and built environment, but looks like there was um, answers across the board, which was good. Does anyone wanna explain why they chose their answer? Or maybe um, I chose- it, oh, Okay, yeah, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, I chose neighborhood and built environment because I think that um, it's just what type of neighborhood you're in really kind of sets you up for the rest of your life. Um, I'm thinking specifically like income because um, it's really hard to um, escape what you're raised in. So I think that uh, neighborhoods, what you're raised in is really important to how it affects the rest of your life and your health. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for sharing. That was helpful. So the second part of the foundational and content or foundational content and background section of this wrap session details an overview of the factors impacting the medical field in four different realms um, from bench top to bedside. And these realms are research slash the lab, education slash the classroom, the hospital and the clinic and the community and home. So for the social determinants of health, those are ones that are like widely recognized, but these ones are just some of the factors that I found to be um, very influential in one's care. So we'll start with the lab and research. So in the medical field, um, over the years, we've accumulated a lot of knowledge, but we also have a lot to, that we have left to discover. So the way we fill in these gaps um, can be through research. And when looking at research for answers, before we even start, it's important to ask ourselves four main questions. Who is conducting research? What research is being, or what is being researched? Why is it being researched? And how is it being researched? So when we tackle the who, I think it's really important to have a diversity of perspectives here. We need many people to ask questions because everyone has different interests. And if only a small group of people are conducting research, we exclude insight from the often much larger majority. Similarly, when looking at the what, why, and how, we must choose a meaningful topic, have a reasonable purpose for investigating such a topic, and pursue the endeavor in an ethical manner. It is important to make sure research is being conducted on all groups in a fair distributed manner, and we cannot truly understand, or we can't truly further our understanding if we are not learning about everyone. Uh, in the world of science, is especially important, as we will discuss later, how do different diseases present um, depending on the patient and their background. Failing to provide compelling answers to the who, what, why, and how of research has led to nightmares throughout the history of research, um, such as the famous or infamous uh, Stanford Prison Experiment, if you may be familiar with. Um, if not, that's okay too. Um, even if such studies have provided useful information, the ends don't always justify the means. Um, could someone unmute or type in the chat and provide us with another example of a questionable research study they may have learned about and maybe also tell us why it would not have been approved under today's protocols? Um, I have one. Um, in the past, they used to conduct like studies um, on African-American patients to see like 
um, how much pain they can endure or like see like how certain diseases act um, with like within African-American um, like immunity. And that's definitely not okay. Yeah. Like- yeah. Thank you. That, that, was, that was definitely a good example. That's one of the other ones I had in mind. Um, I know there was, um, I think it was maybe during the 19 or 1800s. I'm not too good with history, but um, they did like syphilis testing on Af- African Americans and try to in order to try to find a cure. So, thank you. That's definitely a, a very relevant example and definitely um, violates pretty much all of the the above what, why, how, and who kind of questions we have here. So, great answer. Thank you. Moving on, um, another important aspect of the field of medicine is education. In medical education, the diagrams and pictures are often only of able white bodies. Um, and this is problematic for many reasons of which are inclusivity and perception. Not only is it just generally bad practice, but in medicine, unequal representation has dire consequences in clinical practice. Uh, you can look at the image here in the bottom left corner and you see two different people uh, with two different presentations or manifestations of the same disease, multiple sclerosis or MS. On the right, we see a black female with multiple sclerosis, and this manifests as general body pain and vision problems. Where on the left, we see a white male with MS manifesting as localized numbness and tingling in the arms and legs. Um, here's just one case of how incredibly equal or how incredibly important equal representation is because these diseases can present differently depending on a person's background. And this is just one of the examples. Um, there's also many others, including COVID. Um, yeah, and this picture up here up top is just one I also found really interesting that's gained a lot of traction lately. Um, it's a black embryo inside or a black embryo and um, it's something that I feel like is just so shocking because all the ones we've seen throughout school, or at least my schooling, have been of white individuals. With regards to the inpatient and outpatient setting, health disparities continue to exist. Um, in terms of treatment, one notable case is the prescription of opioid medication. After procedures which have a painful recovery, it has been shown that white individuals are more likely to get prescribed opioid painkillers, which are whereas non-white individuals are more likely to get prescribed non-opioid analgesics or painkillers. Similar disparities in treatment according to a patient's demographic background have also been shown to exist even in the rate of initially offering um, these types of procedures. Another barrier to providing quality medical care is cultural competence. Uh, One prominent example is the ability to transcend linguistic differences. Lack of an interpreter or cultural mediator can prevent effective communication, if any is even able to occur in the first place, uh, between a provider and a patient. Improving any gaps in health literacy, a separate but related matter, is also nearly uh, impossible in this capacity. And lastly, community and home. Both within and outside of a medical setting, insurance has a large impact on patient care. What medication one one is able to obtain, what procedures one can have, and what facilities one can receive treatment at are largely dictated by one's insurance coverage. Related to this topic is the ability to access and the quality of pre- and post-visit medical care. At the very root of the medical field is prevention. Prevention for many conditions can occur via means such as healthy diet, exercise, and just general health screenings. The access to all of these and other preventative measures, however, is determined by the non-medical factors we've discussed, such as insurance coverage and financial well-being. Similarly, uh, post-op care or post-operative care, such as involvement with social services or follow-up appointments can vary depending on one's access to transportation. So as you can see, there are, not, there are many non-medical factors that can influence one's medical care. This next part will involve a lot less of me talking and a lot and give you a chance kind of to meet some other people in today's wrap session. So for this case study portion uh, for the next 30 minutes-ish, um, there will be two breakout rooms that you guys will go into. 
Um, but before that, I'm going to present with you with a real community health issue um, related to some of the content that I previously touched on. And then you will be split into the first breakout room and discuss some solutions that you think um, could help remedy this problem. And then you'll come back and I will present a, the real solution that was taken. Um, first, before that, you guys will kind of present a summarized version of what your group came up with to the larger group and make sure to elect kind of like a spokesperson when you're in your breakout room too. And then after that, now I will present the real course of action taken by either the government, the health organizations, or the community. And then you'll go back into the breakout rooms um, and then discuss with your group kind of um, what you think, if you thought this, the solution was effective um, or anything that you changed about it or if it wasn't effective. Um, yeah, so um, if you could drop the, or I think the link, yeah, right here. So you'll click on this link and then um, Basanti will help put you in breakout rooms and then from there, just remember the, the number that it says on the screen, it'll say like join breakout room and then a number, remember that number and then log into this document right here and click the link that um, is associated with your breakout room number. So it's just kind of talking about how would you address housing barriers in California and, you know, as of January, there is about 160,000 um, people homeless on any given day. And of those 160,000, about a third um, were experiencing chronic homelessness. Um, so homelessness for extended periods of time. So um, what was actually done was a two part thing. One of them, or the first part was Project Room Key. Um, and this was called Project Room Key because um, like it initiative provided temporary shelter for people experiencing homelessness um, by kind of letting them stay and renting out hotel rooms that were unbooked for them. And uh, overall, the goal was just kind of to minimize the strain on the healthcare system and it was a temporary fix. Um, but this initiative worked so well um, that they did an expansion called Pro Project Home Key. Um, and this initiative actually purchased old hotels, apartments, and other buildings and converted them into long-term housing for homeless residents. Um, a lot of this work was focused in the Bay Area and 846 million was initially invested in the Project Room Key. But this expansion added on another just shy of $3 billion um, dollars for, or, yeah, for cities, counties, and nonprofits to create permanent homeless housing or at least long term homeless housing. So um, after this, or after you got a time, some time just to kind of process uh, what was occurring, I think we can drop that second link in the chat. Um, and then in this one, you'll just kind of reflect on this initiative and see whether you think it was effective. Maybe talk about some pros and cons you have. Um, yeah, and then we'll come back and kind of share as a larger group. All right, looks like most people are back. So um, why don't we start with group one and you can kind of just talk about what your um, own proposal was and then how you thought that compared to the actual proposal and any pros and cons of each you guys discussed. Um, one of us found that um, Project Room Key was similar to solutions that they had already been thinking of. Um, and another person took into the consideration that the fact of California, like the cost of living there is really high. So this was a really good idea. Um, but we also realized uh, with it, it, there's like a risk of creating like poor communities and making like risking that there's like some segregation between like, oh, that's where all the homeless people live versus, oh, those are the rich neighborhoods, which already like exists, but I think it's still a risk to take into consideration. All right. Yeah. Thank you. That's way more than I thought of. So appreciate that. 
Um, we can go with group two now. Yeah, so our group, um, we kind of had a mixture of like uh, solutions that are similar to these two um, and similar to what groups uh, group one said, um, like the cost of living is really high in California. So even if like um, hotels, apartments and other buildings are purchased for long-term housing for these homeless residents, like you still have to take into account like transportation and like food and how much of those will cost. Um, Additionally, like just as group one said, like a stigma could arise because we already, we already know like how homelessness is seen in America. Um, if there's like one building where all the homeless people live, like that stigma could rise and they could find, they can have trouble like finding jobs, um, which in turn affects their income even more. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I like how you incorporated a bunch of different factors there as very insightful. Group three. Yeah, we discussed pretty similar stuff. Um, one difference was that in some of our proposals, it was actually the hospital funding it because uh, a lot of people who are in house end up in emergency rooms simply because they're in house and it was actually served as a cost cutting initiative at the hospital. Um, Obviously, this solution is more like broadly funded, which is great. And we also discussed how it could be scalable to different levels, like countywide, townwide, citywide, even just like private, um, like charity wise, and also how this could also be beneficial to the businesses involved because they do get that guaranteed minimum rent or income. Yeah, thank you. That's a great answer. Um, how about next group? Yeah, so in our group, we had a hard time coming up with like an actual concrete solution, but some of the things that we talked about um, were either kind of like requiring um, regular buildings to also provide like a certain amount of low income housing, which I believe is something they do in New York. Um, I don't know how well that actually works. Um, another thing we talked about was kind of um, maybe focusing on like one kind of like category of people. So maybe like um, family households for that. Um, and like providing like better quality housing um, for that category, I guess, like first so that they can like have a better environment to like raise kids and things. Um, and then some of the pros and cons that my second breakout group talked about was like pro. Um, it does provide housing and like an address for people to put down, which is really helpful. Um, some of the cons that we talked about were that it doesn't really address kind of like the root of the problem, though. Um, which is that just like living expenses in California are really expensive. Um, so it does give people kind of like a foothold to um, make some like growth and things, but it, there are still gonna be a lot of problems um, with access to other needs. Yeah, thank you, that's a great answer. Yeah, of course there's like, there's no realistic expectation you can set to come up with like a concrete answer in less than five minutes, but I think that's really good so far, so. And I think there's one more group, right? Or is that yeah. the one? Oh, I, can, I can talk from our group. Um, we had very similar kind of discussions as everyone else. I think a lot of our kind of questions was that we kind of um, were like, on one hand, this is really great that people are um, being offered shelter, but then we were kind of looking into it a little more like uh, project home keys as it's long-term, then project room key is short-term and temporary. And we were wondering like, what are the restrictions? Like, how do people get into the program? Um, you know, are people getting services provided to them beyond housing? Because like, just because you have shelter doesn't mean, you know, it's going to help you get out of homelessness. Um, you know, if that's something they're trying to do. Um, and I know a lot of cities, I think even St. Paul has a similar project happening right now too. So I think it's something that we're kind of seeing elsewhere. So yeah, just wondering like how it's going to work long term, I guess. Thank you. Yeah, that's another great answer. Um, I think like the kind of goal was to just to kind of get people back up on their feet again. And then, you know, that someone brought up the address thing. I don't remember who, but I think that's a great point. Um, even for like job applications, you know, everyone requires an address or like an email. So providing something like that is definitely very helpful. Yeah. And then just in the interest of time, um, the next two we'll just kind of do like in the large group um, where everybody can kind of give their ideas. So the next one here is how would you address transportation barriers in Denver? 
So at Denver Health, um, which is a large safety net hospital, um, there was an alarming rate of no-shows for outpatient visits. And additionally, patients who were seen um, were waiting an extended period of time after they um, said they could go home, um, just sitting around at the hospital. So, And then after kind of surveying some patients, the hospital identified um, kind of a lack of transportation to and from as the primary culprit of this issue. So um, would anyone like to just kind of um, off the top of their head, maybe think of a solution that you can um, propose right away? Sorry, I'm not giving a lot of time here, but um, if anyone can just maybe put something in the chat as well, that'd be just as great. Okay, yeah, I see Uber um, and make the city more bicycle and walk friendly, which is something that we talked about with the parks and recreation. That's great, and transportation. And discount vouchers, lift codes, similar to Uber. Yeah, all great answers. So, oh, shared ride program, okay, along the same lines. Patient shuttle. Yeah, well, it looks like you guys kind of um, caught on to the, the idea here. So, um, what they ended up doing is partnering with Lyft and collaborated to let patients use the rideshare service um, to and from the hospital and in the inpatient setting and also certain outpatient clinics, but they're still working on expanding it to all outpatient clinics um, as the last time that I looked at it. So um, yeah, I mean, I guess there's, there's not a whole ton of discussion there. Um, seems like a lot of people were on the same page. So um, does anyone have anything else to add here with the, the pros and cons, maybe something they liked or a problem they see with using this um, either in the short or long term, either like unmuting or the, the chat is great as well. Um, off the bat, like I thought of Uber and like Lyft and I agree with it, but I think like some people might not have like access to um, like digital devices that can help them like obviously get a list. So I think just taking in that aspect and considering like alternatives for people to um, reach Lyft, which I, I don't use those services a lot. So maybe like there's a phone number you can call to, which I guess would help, but some people might not also have access to a phone. Yeah, that, that was a great point to bring up too. And in addition to that, like, I guess some people might not always have like a concrete place to return home to. Um, and someone said inconsistent Lyft drivers. Yep, definitely something that experienced here even, um, lack of Wi-Fi access and maintaining funding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think someone was talking about um, how like having the hospital pay for the, even the um, project room key and project home key and how that would decrease the cost. So definitely something that I guess you could look into is the hospital um, paying for the program long-term if it would decrease their overall costs, but definitely probably better options out there. Issues with comfortability. All right, that's that's another good point to bring up. Yeah, I think that you guys kind of hit it on the nail there. And then, yeah, again, just in the interest of time, um, I guess for this next one, I'll just kind of briefly give you an overview about it since um, I only had it in case we we're running a little bit low on time as well. This one is just a much smaller scale and it involves one Northeast Tennessee middle school where a population of children at risk of not meeting educational standards set by the state was identified. And some of the factors associated with these at-risk children were low socioeconomic status, behavioral misconduct, and truancy. And then to kind of address this issue, one student actually, um, for their thesis, they created this program called the LISTEN program. And it was a mentoring program um, called LISTEN because it was titled Linking Individual Students to Educational Needs. And the program first uh, quantitatively identified these students based on their test scores and background, and then provided them with the opportunity to be um, paired with positive adult role models um, that weren't their teachers, just people in the community who volunteered. Uh, and then the mentors worked with these students to teach them positive behaviors and decision-making skills. And it was actually found to be effective, at least in the study. Um, it was kind of a significantly or statistically significant difference between the kids who were paired with mentors 
versus the kids who chose to decline the mentorship option. Yeah, well, thank you guys for participating in the case studies. And then for this next section, last but not least, we have our guest speaker panel, which I'm pretty excited about. So for this, each speaker chose to discuss a different topic somewhere along the lines of the intersection of health and medicine and equity. And like I mentioned at the beginning of the session, we were lucky to be joined by three guest speakers who I introduced just right before the, they present. So first up is um, Dr. Dave Olson. Uh, Dr. Olson is a graduate of the University of Minnesota Medical School and is a physician specializing in sports medicine. He provides care for multiple major sports teams and athletic groups, and is also an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota. Um, he's passionate about sports and adolescent medicine and community outreach. So yeah, I guess whenever you're ready, um, Dr. Olson, take it away. Cool. How are you doing, everyone? Hey, Joey. Good, thank you. Oh, good. Thanks. Thanks for having me on today. Um, this is awesome. I, I've been listening in a little bit and uh, just fantastic discussion um, so far and everything, especially with those case studies. So um, as Joey said, and uh, I, I've known Joey for many, many years now, um, but pleasure to be on this. And I'm just going to share a little bit about what I do uh, in medicine. And I know we have sort of like 10 minute slots, so I'll, I'll get through that pretty quickly. And then hopefully leave a little time uh, up for everyone in case you have any questions uh, for me or, or thoughts about sort of my path and everything so far. Um, so like uh, Joey said, I'm a, a assistant professor over at the University of Minnesota. I'm a family medicine and sports medicine physician. Um, and I work currently over in a few different spots. I work over at Broadway Family Physicians. Uh, which is a family practice clinic where we also have a residency program from the University of Minnesota. So we have uh, people that just finished med school uh, that are doing family medicine over in the North Minneapolis community. Um, and then along with that, I also do sports medicine and provide uh, team and sports coverage for the University of Minnesota, um, as well as a bunch of high schools. So I live over in the Roseville community. So have helped out with uh, Roseville uh, High School Sports, uh, North Minneapolis with our residents, uh, as well as Robbinsdale Cooper High School. Uh, and then also help out sort of in the professional sports realm with the, uh, being a team doctor with the Minnesota Vikings and Minnesota Twins. So sort of a lot of different stuff going on there, but just wanna tell you a little bit about my path and you know, mostly diving into what some of the challenges that, that I see with sort of a lot of the social determinants of health uh, in the communities that I serve. So for, um, for me personally, I was sort of born and raised in North St. Paul, so in the Twin Cities area. Um, I went to undergraduate school at uh, Gus Davis and also Dillard University in New Orleans. Um, and when I was doing that, I was always, I, I was a biology major thinking, you know, probably I would be a, a biology teacher and uh, potentially go into coaching. Uh, but when I was down at school at uh, Dillard University, which is a, a HBCU, historically black college and university in New Orleans, I had a professor that sort of reached out to me and said, hey, you're doing really good in these classes and everything. Maybe you should look into uh, going into medicine. Um, I was, you know, pretty excited to have someone take some time to actually, uh, you know, say something like that to me. And that professor actually helped me uh, get a summer internship working uh, at the University of Miami in South Florida, uh, uh, working for a summer at uh, a homeless clinic in the Overtown community, which is a uh, underrepresented, uh, underrepresented neighborhood uh, in Miami. So that summer pretty much changed my life and, and really sort of led me down a path of where I am now. Uh, working with that doctor, I saw how amazing it is to work in a community that has issues with sort of all five areas you've probably been talking about tonight. Um, so economic stability, education access, the neighborhood itself, uh, healthcare access, and also sort of that social and community context all came into play for me 
uh, with that summer internship. So I really got to see a doctor that was out there in the community making a difference, um, trying to help. And after that summer, I knew that I, I really wanted to go into medicine. Um, so for me, that path became coming back to the University of Minnesota and going to medical school. Uh, and I knew I wanted to go into family medicine first and foremost uh, to sort of help with the, you know, the whole, you know, gamut of, of patient care from pediatrics to geriatrics and everything in between. Um, and for me, the uh, area of sports medicine, I was a high school and college athlete, so I really liked that area. But I also like that intertwining of, of working with uh, sort of the adolescent medicine side of, of sports medicine in the communities that I serve as well. Um, so with that being said, I've really jumped um, into being that family doc in the community in North Minneapolis. And much like that summer experience that I had in Miami and the Overtown community, um, if people have been around uh, North Minneapolis and, and seen that community right here in the Twin Cities, we have a lot of, uh, you know, things that we deal with in those five different uh, domains as well. So economic stability is always a big issue for a lot of our uh, patient population in North Minneapolis. Um, there's a lot of discussions around education access and quality, um, as well as uh, that healthcare access. And that's a big piece of what we try to provide and what I try to provide uh, with my practice at, at Broadway uh, Family Physicians. So what we want to make sure that our patients know in that community is, you know, we are in the community. We're here to help you. Um, you deserve uh, the same quality of care that our patients get in other communities within the Twin Cities. Uh, and we want people to be proud of their neighborhood and try to push that social and community context to, to make it be an area that, um, that we're proud of. So a lot of people will, you know, will ask me, well, like, hey, you, know, you, you take care of all these you know, very rich athletes with the Minnesota Vikings and twins. You know, why, why are you over in North Minneapolis? And for me, that's really the basis of what I do is to try to be in a neighborhood like North Minneapolis to help folks there and have them realize, you know, you can get the same quality of care as a Minnesota Vikings player. Like we want to make sure that everyone has access to not only healthcare, but quality healthcare, right? It's not just that, you know, you have some lower level of healthcare if you live in an urban underserved area, you need to have that same access that, you know, our, our Minnesota Vikings get and everything like that. Um, a big piece of what I do over in North Minneapolis too is on the education side of things. Um, so being a residency clinic at Broadway, we teach uh, folks that have just finished medical school and have decided to go on uh, to do a three-year residency in family medicine. So a lot of those residents we have eight residents each year that are diving into our North Minneapolis community to provide good quality care there um, and at North Memorial Hospital uh, as well. And then within that, we also do a sports medicine fellowship at the University of Minnesota. So every year we have two people that have finished a three-year family medicine residency, either here locally or across the country. They'll come in and provide and learn more about sports medicine and uh, sort of cover those teams, whether it's the, you know, North Minneapolis High School, Robbinsdale Cooper, Roseville. Um, they'll hang out with us at the University of Minnesota and also with the, with the Twins and Vikings to provide that uh, good quality sports medicine care. And one thing I'll say, like with, with sports medicine um, on the primary care side, the difference between us and, and doing like orthopedics where, you know, you're taking care of someone if they tear their ACL, you're taking some care of someone if they sprain their ankle or have a concussion, we're really taking care of that complete person. So it's, you know, if someone has diabetes or high blood pressure, asthma, we're dealing with those issues. If people have mental health issues, which is a huge, huge thing. And, and hopefully, um, you know, not only athletes, but people in our community are feeling more comfortable about dealing with those issues. We're taking care of those things as well. So we really strive to, to you know, be there, 
not only in, in the North community, but be there for um, you know, people of all backgrounds to take care of uh, the complete person and really help uh, deliver that care. So I would say, you know, again, in our community and where I practice medicine, there are a lot of challenges and a lot of challenges in those uh, five areas that you all have been talking about tonight. Um, you know, economic stability um, has been an issue and there's been a lot of pushes in the North Minneapolis community to try to help that. Um, education access, one thing I'll say is, um, if anyone knows North Minneapolis, North Minneapolis High School, um, so North High was about to close about five to, you know, five or six years ago because everyone would leave the North Minneapolis community, uh, you know, thinking things were bigger and brighter if they transferred out and open enrolled in different high schools. Over the last five years, I think we've developed a lot of pride in our uh, in uh, North High School and, and now kids are staying not only for um, you know, the educational side of things, but to have a quality sort of gamut of an experience within uh, education, sports, uh, and other things as well. So that is a huge thing for us. And like I said, also providing and working with the community, not only on the healthcare side of things, but everything else that uh, the North Minneapolis community needs. So that's sort of a little background as far as uh, what I do with my day-to-day -day stuff. And I you know, love to answer any questions that any of you might have. Uh, and again, really appreciate uh, your time and having me on here tonight. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, if anyone has a couple of questions for Dr. Olson, um, they can either unmute and say them or I can read them out in the chat, either one works. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you see the chat, um, but uh, Asante, who um, runs this whole program, she says that her older sister um, manages the clinic over there. So, that's uh, awesome. yeah, so it's yeah, action right there. <laughs> yeah, so that's super cool. So uh, one thing that one thing that happened and that brings up is sort of during all the uh, social unrest and everything that happened last summer, our our clinic was further down Broadway, a little closer to 94 for a long, long period of time. And it actually got looted, flooded, and, and fairly destroyed um, during, uh, during some of the protests and riots that happened. So now we do have a nice uh, brand new clinic that actually it used to be a CVS store down on Broadway and Penn, and now that's our, our brand new clinic. And it's uh, super awesome and something that is amazing because the community is very proud um, to have this cool new clinic and, and a beautiful space for people to come in and get their care. So that's, uh, that's a huge thing. Yeah, and then I think we have one last question that came yeah. in here. Um, how do you develop and maintain trust in medicine in underserved communities? Right. So it's a big thing. Obviously, with the pandemic, there's been a lot of issues for trust in, in people across the boards and not just, you know, obviously vaccinations have, has been a huge, thing, a huge thing. I think one of the big things for me is now I've been, I've been doing this now for a while. I'm one of the older folks around. So I, I've been in the North community for about 20 years now. And part of it is just being there. Like you, you have to be there you have to show up, you have to be in the community, going over to the high school and, and being present for some of the games. Um, you know, the community sees if, if you're around, if you're someone that just swings in quick to the community, does a little work and takes off, I don't think you develop the relationships you need to actually, you know, make change or have people trust you. So I think a huge thing of it, and it's the same thing in sports medicine for us, is being around, being available, um, and actually being a part of that community is what really, you know, uh, develops that trust with with everyone else. So that's that's a huge thing. That's a that's a great question because that's a big piece of what you have to do. Yeah, and thank you so much. Um, everybody really enjoyed your talk, and really appreciate you coming on today. You bet. I appreciate it, Joey. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much. You bet. All right. So next up, we have um, Sarah Sackley. And Sarah is a recent graduate of the University of Minnesota, where she completed the Community Engagement Scholars Program, alongside a double major in Chicano Studies and English and Social Justice. 
she has done substantial work with the homeless community and is currently a master's of public health student. Hello, hi, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, that's great. Okay, thank goodness. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this. Part of my master's program right now is talking or doing a lot of research on different social determinants of health. And my focus is specifically with the population experiencing homelessness and people with opioid use disorder. Uh, so I thought I, I put together like a little like information session. Uh, so I ran some numbers and in January of 2022, there were 1,682 people who stayed in shelters in Hennepin County. Uh, the average age of death in the population experiencing homelessness is 43 years old. And for all of Minnesota, it's about 80 years. So what I want to talk about specifically around the social determinants of health is just the basic, basic necessities housing, food, clean water, and, you know, social, social, um, a social structure that's supportive. So with the population experiencing homelessness, one thing that we often talk about is the importance of food and how food is essentially medicine. Food can determine your health. Uh, so for example, in people who have diabetes, if you're homeless, and you're eating what you're given, essentially. It's a lot of white uh, pastas, a lot of white breads. Typically, it's two slices of bread, one piece of bologna, maybe a piece of cheese. So that really has put detrimental strain on that population health-wise, which is also driving the age of the average age of, of dying down lower and lower. The same is for housing. Housing is health care. So as people become homeless, uh, poor health is either a cause or a result of that homelessness. Something I often tell people is that if you if someone becomes homeless and they don't have a mental health disorder at all, they will most likely have one by the time that they exit homelessness, just because you're in this constant survival state of where am I gonna get my next meal? Where am I gonna sleep tonight? Will I have what I need to survive? Or, you know, will I even just be comfortable? Will I be happy? You know, who can I rely on in my life? Something that um, Dr. Olson talked about was just having, having that structure of being present and being in the community and that's how people get to trust you. And that is entirely true. Uh, I spent many, many years just doing outreach, talking to people when I worked at, I worked at a shelter slash housing facility. So I do outreach in the shelter just to build those relationships. And it took a long time. So just being present and being there is a really good way to like add to that social structure that someone has. They know they can come to you when they have issues or they need help with something. Even if it's something that you don't know how to do, you probably know someone who can do it or you can point them in the right direction. Um, so uh, around those sorts of social determinants of health, um, a really big thing is just harm reduction. And that's honestly, I'm biased. This is my specialty that I, I work a lot on is Harm reduction. So essentially harm reduction is the concept of giving people supplies and giving people accessibility to spaces where they can reduce harm. So for example, um, drinking alcohol can be dangerous. So we have assigned public spaces where people can go and do that. They can also do it in their home if they have a home, but we have bars, you know, we have social events where people can come together and, and uh, drink alcohol together. Same, another example of harm reduction is seat belts. So cars are really dangerous. Without a seat belt, there would be many more deaths likely. Uh, but instead of saying, well, let's just never drive cars ever again, they're too dangerous. We're like, well, let's reduce it by adding seat belts, adding um, airbags and stuff for when there are accidents. So my rendition of harm reduction that I work a lot with is the concept that people are going to use drugs. They are going to inject drugs, they're going to smoke drugs for many, many reasons. And instead of saying, what if we just don't allow anyone to do any drugs? Why don't we just say, let's get people what they need 
uh, in order to use drugs in a safer way. So obviously with injection drugs, there's a lot of risk of hepatitis C and HIV and other transmissible diseases when people share needles. Uh, same with smoking drugs. If you use a glass pipe, you could burn your lip, your blood could get on it, you pass it to the next person, then they have your blood in, your, in their body and you may have hep C, HIV, MRSA. There's a whole, a whole list of, of uh, highly contagious diseases. And this is a problem we're seeing in the community right now, uh, specifically among people who experience homelessness and are in the indigenous community and who use injection drugs. Um, so part of that, we're trying to build in this population a more social structure to improve the, the health outcomes. Um, so one thing that we're doing in the community uh, with Healthcare for the Homeless and with many other, many other organizations do this as well, is hand out clean needles. So people can use a new needle every time they inject or handing out different types of pipes that people like to smoke out of or, or foil kits. There's a lot of different options and condoms also condoms go along with all of it. Um, so the point of harm reduction is to just try and say, all right, people are gonna live where they're gonna live or they're gonna exist as they want to exist. And instead of trying to take away their autonomy, we should instead empower them to, to have that social structure, have a place where they can go where it is safer to do what they want to do or what they need to do to medicate, to self-medicate or to just you know, exist the way they want to exist. Um, let's see what else. So yeah, that was, that was sort of, I tried to make it short and sweet. I know we've got a time crunch here. Uh, on the next slide, I also threw on my email address. Feel free to email me if you ever have any questions or you wanna talk about the population experiencing homelessness or anything. Um, I'm happy to support you guys and however would be useful. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, if anyone has any questions right off the top of their head, um, feel free to type something in the chat or unmute and ask. Um, otherwise, yeah, she, she did put her email down that you can use. Um, Dr. Olson also put his email in the chat if you guys are wondering how to contact him as well. Um, yeah, but if anyone has any questions, now's the time. So Kartik asks, um, are there any ways to support harm reduction centers in our community? Great question, thank you. Absolutely. So currently I'm working with the East Phillips Neighborhood Organization, which is like Franklin Avenue between like Cedar and, um, oh man, like Chicago probably. I don't know the exact outline. They are actually just starting up uh, some talks with neighbors about opening up a safe, an overdose uh, prevention site, which is essentially would be a space like a clinical sort of space where people could come and they would be provided with any clean supplies that they wanted. And then they would be able to use in like recliners or comfortable spaces. So it wouldn't be like, you know, institutional. It would just be, you know, clean and hygienic in order to, to use drugs in whichever way they prefer. And then there would be nurses and other health practitioners on site to reverse any overdoses that are occurring. And currently in the United States, there's only, I think, one overdose prevention site in New York that just opened up. And that is monumental. So uh, a good way to support the harm reduction in, this, in the community is I would look up Southside Harm Reduction. They do amazing work. They're completely, well, they're mostly volunteer run and they're very, very, um, I wanna say, I wanna say radical. I like the word radical. I'll say they're very much ahead of the fold when it comes to how they approach harm reduction. Um, and I'll, I'll put down some names in the chat too, but just like being supportive of it, talking to other people about it, we need to create like an understanding that drug use is not something that should be hidden. Like that's how people overdose and die. Like my aunt almost died from an opioid overdose. And just most, a lot of people know people in their lives who've had these experiences. So if we can start talking about it and making it more socially acceptable of People are going to use drugs. We can't stop that. Uh, and just because someone uses drugs doesn't mean that they're inherently a bad person or they're just choosing it. Like decreasing the stigma is going to be a huge, a huge um, player when it comes to getting more harm reduction in the community. 
because currently, even if you're diabetic, carrying syringes is a crime. So that is, it's a crime. Uh, so anyway, I'll put those names in the chat for you. Yeah, thank you. That was great. Yeah, so and then the last speaker of the night is Carly. Carly is also a University of Minnesota alumni. And then here she completed her undergraduate studies in family social science with a specialization in diversity and mental health. She later went on to graduate school at Lesley University and obtained a Master's of Arts in Clinical Mental Health Counseling, a field with which she has gained extensive experience um, as a professional. And currently she works at, as a mental health program manager at My Health for teens and young adults. So Carly, um, yeah, feel free to take it away whenever you're ready. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, as Joey said, my name is Carly Gershon. Um, I have my little sparse uh, slide here, so I'll try not to take too much time. Um, so I'm the mental health program manager at My Health for Teens and Young Adults, which is a clinic that serves people ages 12 to 26. Um, it's been open since the early 70s. We're actually celebrating our 50 year anniversary uh, this year. So if you wanna come out and hang out with us, that'll be in June. Um, so we offer medical services, including annual physicals, reproductive care, sexual health care. Um, we also have a health education and outreach team and they go out to a ton of schools in the area. Um, they offer education workshops in the community. Um, we have a program called Becoming, which is for youth who are pregnant and parenting. So we have a public health nurse who goes in home um, to help with anything they might need. Um, my role basically is to make sure that the mental health program is running smoothly. Um, I also have a caseload of clients. Um, I'm a clinical supervisor as well. So I meet with therapists who are in the process of getting their licenses. And here at My Health, we see people with a wide variety of concerns and diagnoses, um, including but certainly not limited to things like depression, anxiety, um, trauma, family issues, OCD, um, and just kind of general stress. We really try as much as possible to remove barriers for folks when it comes to mental health care access. It, really should be the easiest system to navigate. And it's one of the most complex for many folks, um, including we also try to remove barriers when it comes to just kind of medical health care too. Like we have a traveling nurse who goes to the community um, for folks who can't like get to the clinic for care with transportation issues. Um, and even though COVID has been you know, of course, a challenge in many ways. It's also made it a lot easier for people to access appointments um, if they don't have transportation because we're able to meet with them virtually. We've also been fortunate enough to raise enough money um, to be able to offer low to no cost mental health care to our clients if they can't afford sessions. And I also go into one of the area high schools um, to increase access and to one of the youth homeless shelters uh, in the Western suburbs. Um, so, but even like with all of that, we recognize that there are definitely disparities. Um, some of our clients don't have consistent access to the internet, for example. Um, some don't have a reliable device to meet virtually. Um, some don't have access to a consistent private space for meetings. Um, if a client has medical assistance, which is like the state funded insurance, they can get uh, free cab rides to any medical or mental health um, appointment, but there are also a lot of issues with that system. And we're unfortunately not super accessible by public transit. We're in downtown Hopkins. So unless people are coming like from the cities, um, it's a little bit harder to get to us by public transit. So these are all areas that we're kind of constantly looking at and trying to improve. Um, just kind of quickly here, last fall, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, um, 
and Children's Hospital Association declared a national emergency uh, in child and adolescent mental health. Um, this was unprecedented. It's never happened before. And while changes are being made, it hasn't really been enough. Um, one of the biggest needs that I've personally seen is not just the need for more mental health services in general, but really the need for more free mental health services. Um, and in addition, there's a national shortage of therapists right now. So if anyone wants to become a therapist, please do. We need you. Um, and our system is really at capacity right now. So these are just a couple of examples. It's really just the tip of the iceberg of the, some of the systemic issues that need to be addressed um, in order for us to be the most effective that we can be. So thank you so much for listening. I'll put my email in the chat too. I forgot to add that to the slide, but yeah, if anybody has questions. Yeah, thank you so much. I know we're running um, just about on time. But yeah, if anyone has any last questions or would like to email, feel free to, I mean, she put her email in the chat, Carly G at myhealthmn.org. Yeah, but if, if not, yeah, you can also um, email me if you have any questions about the PowerPoint or um, any ways that you, or if you're looking for any ways to volunteer in healthcare. Um, I know of a couple opportunities, so feel free to contact me at the email listed on the screen. And yeah, I just wanted to thank all of you so much for attending this session and I want to thank the guest speakers for their great work. So, but otherwise that is it. So um, have a great rest of your day. Mm -hmm.